I'm thrilled to have a colleague and friend of many years, not to be confused with an old colleague, um, Jackie Pick, <laughs> with us. Uh, we worked together when she was the legislative counsel uh, to the chairman of the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution. Uh, men I admire greatly, despite a lot of difficulties of late, Congressman Trent Franks. Uh, Jackie is a lawyer, of course. Um, she has become a celebrity, if you will. Uh, she runs the Jackie Daily radio program, which is broadcast from a place not too far from here, I believe. Um, it is an energy-focused show, but uh, she is a woman of many parts, and one of them is uh, she has extraordinary knowledge about and concern over the topic that we're here to discuss. Thank you and for being here. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Kevin, and all of you for being here. And the only reason I'm leaving you is because I have to go make a show. Otherwise, I would stick around because I'd actually really be interested in your Q&A. Um, it's always interesting for me to hear from people in real America who think clearly, as opposed to where I spent the last seven years before I got to Texas, which is Washington, D.C., in the bubble. Uh, in a city where everyone's on the payroll of the federal government. So people there think differently uh, d by default. And so uh, I really, there, there are so many things I could tell you, it's difficult to narrow it down. But what I'm gonna do is explain some of the things that I saw and heard while working on Capitol Hill there for seven years, served a member who was on both the Judiciary Committee and the Armed Services Committee. So those are two committees that are tasked with national security, or well, with defending the country from threats, both within and without. Um, in judiciary in particular, where I also was a shared staffer, so I worked both for the congressman and for the committee, um, we had oversight of the FBI, of the NSA, of the entire Department of Justice, uh, and then at times, DHS too. And so, um, as you know, that means that we had a constitutional duty, not, a, you know, not an option, but a duty, to oversee the executive branch. And I was there both during the Bush years and the Obama years. Um, big changes came after Mr. Obama was elected, and I'm not making a partisan statement. This, it's not exclusively from his administration. We had some trouble in the Bush administration too, um, which became obvious in that we were in this war and it seemed like every single week we were fighting the war in the committee. So the questions we were handling were, can you waterboard Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? And if yes, how often? Can you uh, hold Gitmo detainees indefinitely without bringing charges? Can you warrantlessly wiretap Americans if you think they're a member of a terrorist group? And things like that that you'll remember. Um, so it's like every week that was the theme when Republicans were in charge of the committee. Um, then flipped the administrations and flipped the House. When uh, a House flips a majority, the other party takes over and they hold the gavel, so they decide the agenda. And uh, in our oversight duty, um, people began coming out of the woodwork. Phil Haney is one who was just mentioned. He was at DHS. Uh, and so many people coming out of the FBI and elsewhere in the Pentagon saying, um, we are really, really concerned because here we are in the midst of this war and we're being asked to do things in these executive agencies that would clearly seem to be counter to the war effort, like scrubbing terrorist databases inside the Department of Homeland Security. And if you really want the full lowdown on that, um, there's a book out there that Phil Haney is a co-author of called See Something, Say Nothing, A Homeland Security Officer Exposes the Government's Submission to Jihad. That sounds a little extreme, but if you read the book, you'd understand what he's talking about. Um, things like this that, that would horrify, I think, most of the American public were being brought to us constantly. When people are inside these agencies and they're being asked to do things that they think violate their duty under the Constitution or violate the law or are dangerous to our security, sometimes um, brave people come out to Congress secretly. They'll find a member or a senator they can trust, staff they can trust, and they'll start pouring out what's going on inside that agency that concerns them. We had um, several of those, and at the same time, I remember um, there were two appointees at the top of DHS in the top slots there 
who were being praised on like Hamas websites in the Middle East, uh, you know, because of their actions. Uh, and, and you know, there were things like this. There were there were problems where you saw the FBI lexicon being scrubbed. Um, all mention of you know Islam, Sharia, Jihad, words like this were being scrubbed so that law enforcement couldn't speak openly. And frankly, these are not words that were acceptable anymore in their common parlance amongst each other. We had um, coalitions of what uh, purported to be Islamic charities or civil rights groups coming together and approaching, you know, it would be Homeland Security, Department of Justice, Pentagon, Langley, uh, State, Department of State, and asking for reforms like purging lexicons or even, uh, you know, suggesting that criticism of Islam would not be permitted in a national security discussion. Now, criticism, you know, is a, is a relative term, right? Um, it, it, let's just put it this way. My boss had a Department of Justice official in front of him for an oversight hearing. We asked, is this true? You know, can you promise this committee, this is on national television, you know, I mean, C-SPAN, but still, it's national television. Uh, can you promise this committee and the American public that you will never implement a regulation or draft a regulation that would restrict criticism of a religion? Can you make that promise? He couldn't do it. Because we were getting this information, and sure enough, we put it to the test to the people in charge, and they weren't able to answer these questions that were really easy to answer. If you believe in a First Amendment, this would have been really easy. Um, and I cannot tell you how valuable, uh, when these things happened, I can't tell you how valuable Frank Gaffney was, the Center for Security Policy was. I met Kevin Freeman at that time. And there's a large circle of people who, m many were former administration officials uh, from the past who really cared about this and saw what was going on. And so the more we worked on this, um, the more reviled we were. I mean, our, our job is to ask questions. We weren't even casting aspersions. We do oversight, we ask questions, we cross-examine. People in charge is our job. And when we'd ask a question like, you know, um, is it true that the top aide to Hillary Clinton sat on a board with a top funder of Al-Qaeda? Here's the information brought to us. Is that true? You know, for asking a question like that, where if that's true, this person should not be in the White House, shouldn't even have a security clearance, you and I, you know, would probably be um, indicted for material support to terrorism if you saw all of the information that we had on some of these people. In fact, some, some of them did go to the penitentiary for material support to terrorism after they've been paraded through the White House and the Pentagon, you know, uh, to lead prayers and trumpeted as, uh, you know, the face of moderate Islam. We're not even criticizing Islam here. You didn't get that far. We're asking, you know, specific questions about specific people uh, who like, like, um, you know, the guy who gave the green light uh, to shoot up Fort Hood. Um, remind me of his name again. Anwar Thank you, Anwar al uh, Born in New Mexico, I think, American citizen, which complicates things. But he had been leading prayers in the Pentagon. Then he goes off to Yemen and directs the shooting at Fort Hood. Uh, we had so many examples of things like that, which proved that the government did not understand the enemy, couldn't identify it, couldn't vet the enemy correctly. And we lost confidence. I mean, there was just the, the evidence just would mount and mount and mount and mount that we either didn't know what we were doing or we knew we were dealing with bad people and we just found it advantageous to do so for a period of time. Uh, and so, so you can imagine how complicated this gets. But anyway, this is just the highlights of what happened on Capitol Hill. Um, and uh, the, the big takeaway here is whoever tried to solve the problem or investigate the problem would be punished, would be blackballed. Your career would be smeared. The, the, it would be, there, it's always a person above you. The leadership team, uh, all of them have strong relationships with people inside groups such as the unindicted co-conspirator uh, CARE, which I'm sure you'll hear about, in the largest terrorism finance trial in US history at that time, which is right here out of Dallas, Texas, up in Richardson. Um, we would try to explain basic things like that. You know, you all, are letting all these care interns into your office, members of the Judiciary Committee, to intern here. This is not a civil rights group. We give them the history. We, I mean, this is, these are not disputed things. And, uh, and it was nothing but scorn and derision for us. And so once in a while, a credible person uh, would, would then pile on with us, like a Newt Gingrich or like an Andrew McCarthy, who started writing it up in National Review Online beautifully, 
I, so I had uh, Andrew McCarthy, who had received the top prosecutors, federal prosecutor's award from Bill Clinton for putting away the blind shake, um, and uh, former Attorney General Mukasey to come in and brief the entire committee. I cannot believe I was able to get that arranged. And I will be hated forever by the senior staff for doing that. Uh, you, you start to wonder, whose side are these people on? We should be able to ask any question we want any time we want. It's our job. It's our duty. Why are you afraid of the question? You know, take whatever position you want, but why are you afraid of the question? And so uh, that's how things were, and it was uh, very demoralizing to live through that and see it get worse and worse and worse uh, for the time I was there, which was uh, 2006 to 2013. And so uh, I came out to Texas to regain my buoyancy and my optimism, <laughs> which happened quickly. The old me came back, and I recognized me again the way I used to be when I was like a you know, hopeful, spry little puppy dog thinking, oh, Washington, D.C., it's great. Everyone's in charge. They know what they're doing. Great country. You know. so, so I got back to being that way. I'm still excited about, you know, I went to Washington last week. I was so excited to be there, which was so different than living there toward the end. Um, so, and of course, there's been a change in leadership, too, which helped a lot, yeah. helped a lot, yeah. um, which I never thought that day would come. But uh, anyway, now I do a show out here and it's all about oil and gas, and uh, that's a direct result of all of the counterterrorism work that I saw on Capitol Hill. It's a direct result, because um, my boss was third generation oil and gas, and um, nearly all the money that funds terrorism, including all the stuff happening in this country, comes from petrodollars, mm -hmm. from the OPEC countries and other countries that are oil producers that rely on oil for their revenues almost exclusively. and um, Therefore, what is good for the U.S. shale revolution and the frackers doubling the supply of oil coming out of this country and flooding the market and cutting the prices by 70% at times, depending, is exactly what's required to bankrupt those countries that are funding the problem. And the problem does not continue, I don't think, except in, in you know, small dispersed ways, if there's no money. There has to be money to carry out the worldwide propaganda campaign, the largest in world history, exported from those countries to probably 200 countries around the world now. And so I actually think, I mean, I, I believe, because you're watching them go broke slowly because of American frackers, thank you, Texas and North Dakota and Pennsylvania and other places, um, I want the American public to support U.S. energy production because uh, that is how we bankrupt them. It's how we bankrupted the Soviet Union, only it did it a different way back then. Um, and it's how we remain a superpower into this century. And I want to do what strengthens us and harms the people who are running planes into the buildings, you know? So it's really, that's really the overarching uh, way that I operate and why I do what I do. And there are a lot of other great reasons to do what I do. I mean, there are great economic reasons that you should support U.S. shale that have nothing to do with national security if we had no enemies in the world. But, uh, but still, it is the uh, patriotic angle that motivated me and I'm actually feeling pretty good about things right now overall. There's still a big problem. Europe's got a major problem. Uh, so, you know, be vigilant. Uh, we'll, we'll never be without the problem. Not in my lifetime, I don't think. But I think the tide has turned. I'm feeling actually optimistic, and I was so not optimistic mm. when I was working on Capitol Hill at the time. So um, there's so much more I could say. Texas, I think. It has a lot to do with Texas. <laughs> I became a Texan on purpose. There's nothing accidental about it. I didn't really know anyone here. I came to Dallas. I think I knew three people in this city. And, um, and you know, they said, you know, you can do the show from Washington. You don't have to move to Dallas. And I'm like, no, no, I'm going to become a Texan. <laughs> I, that's it. That's what I want. I belong there. I'm the kind of immigrant you want. I bring good influences. You know, I don't bring bad politics with me. Um, and so, uh, anyway, there's so much more I could say, but I'm probably almost out of time, so I'll turn it back to Frank. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.